Hi, we are going to discuss Flannery O'Connor today with Karen Swallow Pryor. I'm going to let Karen introduce herself, but I'm really excited because I feel like Karen's work and my work is very simpatico. And um, I think you'll get the gist of that as we geek out about Flannery during this conversation. But to start us off, I asked Karen if she would just introduce herself to anybody who doesn't know her. Sure, Jessica. So good to be talking with you and especially talking about Flannery. Um, I am research professor of English and Christianity and culture at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. I love all things Flannery, even though, I mean, Flannery is sort of like my guilty pleasure because my actual specialty is 18th century British literature and the English novel. So a little bit of 19th century. Um, but Flannery, I think, has all of the uh, of the great things that many of those um, favorite writers of mine have. Yeah, I think of you so much as someone who, you know, the Anglophile that I know when Jen Frey and I were talking about Confederacy of Dunces, she assumed you would like it, I think, because of how much you love Flannery. I assumed you wouldn't because I always think of you as an Anglophile. Like, right. That I love I remember that conversation. I actually got it on Audible and started listening and then had to drop it for whatever reason. It's still there. And I actually did enjoy it. And the connection there, I mean, we can talk about this more, but the connection is that sort of satirical witty bent, which really defines 18th century British writing mm -hmm. and of course Flannery. <laughs> wow, I didn't I didn't think about that. You're right, because he quotes Swift all the time and well, and Confederacy of Dunces is actually one of the novels that I list in my recommended reading in The Scandal of Holiness. I thought about using him as kind of a holy fool type hmm. character, but more via negativa, not someone you emulate in life. Right, right. <laughs> and I think that that's what Flannery does too, right? The same kind of via negativa. I mean, she's not really right. showing you, there's not very many holy characters in her fiction I can think of it like a handful, but I don't know what you think. No, absolutely. I mean, yeah. it's almost, I, and this is another quality, I guess I like about her because most of the literature I love most, uh, including the 18th and 19th century novels are like negative examples. Mm -hmm. um, and they just have so much to teach us. I mean, who likes Pollyanna, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Flannery just, she really gives us a lot of, uh, of negative examples. Yeah. Well, I think that's why I get into debates with people who love um, Wendell Berry novels and Marilyn Robinson novels, because I feel like I'm reading Pollyanna. I think we're on the same page here, friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I when I first read your book, so I was asked to review on Reading Well. I don't know when it was, 2017 or 2018. When did this come out? It came out in 2018. 2018. So. so that's when I would have received a copy. And when I got it, I thought, oh, this is exactly what I have been working on. Because I started working on my book 2014, looking at virtues and literature. But as I was reading, I was completely thunderstruck because... As, as someone who actually specializes in Flannery O'Connor, right? You said you specialize 18th, 19th century British literature. Um, I thought there's no way I'm going to learn anything from this writer on Flannery O'Connor. And I did. And I thought it was masterful. And I also thought our books um, almost become somewhat of a sequel to each other. I mean, I would highly recommend people get this book if they are intending to read my book because I think they go so well together. But when you talk about Flannery, something I hadn't thought about before um, especially in terms of suffering, which is really what I write on, you were writing about humility. And you talk about how she prepares her characters for humility with that sort of violence. She, you write, O'Connor's use of violence in her stories brings about the sort of affliction of the soul, the humiliation that allows for repentance and redemption. And I thought that that's exactly right. What mm -hmm. she's doing is in a sense, she's treating her characters like God's friends. Flannery always says, you know, God's friends are the ones who suffer, right? Right. And she treats her characters not like they're Pollyanna, but they're those who need that affliction. Right, right. And if if I can just pick up on and maybe talk about one of my, you know, well, I, I guess everyone's favorite O'Connor story, or at least one of the ones that people are most often introduced to is A Good Man is Hard to Find. I didn't write about that on, on a story on, on Reading Well, I could have. But, you know, we have this character of a, of a grandmother who um, 
you know, thinks very highly of herself. She's pretty self-satisfied and mm -hmm. um, content with life and actually, you know, and proud. I mean, I think mm -hmm. we find a lot of proud characters in O'Connor, but just picking up on, on that idea that we were just talking about this grandmother. I mean, it is very violent. It's one, it's one of the most yeah. violent stories and unsettling ones. It's very disturbing, but she really needs to be prepared for, through humiliation and that happens through violence to receive the grace that she just barely receives yeah. at the end before her life is taken. And even though that story is so hard and, and so disturbing, it is one of the ones that I think really demonstrates what you just read that, yeah. from my book about that humiliation that prepares us to receive grace. Why do you think that, I mean, in the fiction that you and I enjoy, where you're seeing these characters that are being humbled by suffering or by these situations in life, right, that really bring them down, why then do you think that it doesn't translate as well when we talk to one another about suffering? Does that make sense? So when you're talking, mm -hmm. when I talk to my friends, you always try to find a way out of the suffering. Mm -hmm. You try to mitigate the conversation about suffering, like it's not your fault, you didn't do it, surely it doesn't hurt that much. I mean, we try to medicate the suffering. Like we're very, mm -hmm. like we, we don't see it as a humbling or it's moving us towards virtue. Instead, we really want to walk away from it as quickly mm -hmm. as possible. Yeah, I, I think I think that's very true. And yet I think we're coming to a place maybe um, as a society, even as a church, where we are becoming more accepting of suffering. I think there's sort of a... Um, a modern, what you just described is a very modern or modernist mm -hmm. approach to suffering, right? Very mm -hmm. Protestant, very reformed. I, I, I'm Baptist. You can't get much more Protestant than that. <laughs> so I, I admit this. I think that, you know, it's the Catholics and O'Connor is, is Catholic, mm -hmm. you know, who have so much to teach us about just sort of, you know, um, facing the suffering and, and not overlooking the suffering. Now it can go too far because we can just, you know, dwell in it and stay in it and wallow in it. And that's certainly not the case, but we can, we can go too far in the other direction, which is to deny it and ignore it and try not to face it. And so I guess maybe for me as someone who is very Protestant, very Baptist has been my whole life and yet has felt very starved for good art mm -hmm. um, and the kind of theology that O'Connor offers in her mm -hmm. short stories. I think that's one of the things that just really draws me to her because it's extreme uh, and it's not what I want to experience in yeah. my life. And it's not how I want to, you know, approach others in my lives who yeah. in my life who might be facing suffering. But by by reading O'Connor's stories, I feel like I get immersed in something that I was missing. Mm -hmm. And then I can go back to my real life and kind of balance it out in a virtuous way. What What about people? I'm sure you have this, you know, teaching Flannery or talking to people about Flannery. What about those who say, well, I don't need more suffering in my life? Like, I'm already suffering. Why would I go and read Flannery O'Connor to suffer more? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that question because I I actually, I, I think that is a valid point. I mean, I think that one of the reasons why I do love violent stories and violent films, mm -hmm. um, it, and I've talked about this with, with people who've, who've said the kinds of things that you've just said, I've had a pretty good life. I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty um, <laughs> wonder bread <laughs> in every regard. I haven't I, until, you know, until a few years ago when I got hit by a bus, that's another story. But other than that, really, I haven't experienced a lot of suffering. And so I think, again, to talk about virtue and kind of being balanced, I need some doses of reality. I need some grit. Mm -hmm. um, and I prefer it through art rather than real life to kind of give me that wider perspective and to understand suffering more. So I completely empathize with someone who has said, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've had so much suffering. I just, you know, I don't want to read more about it or, or experience it in art because they need balance in mm -hmm. another way. Mm -hmm. But do you think that Flannery provides any of that balance? Do you think that reading the suffering within the context of the whole work might change someone's perspective on their own suffering that gives them a con like if you're in the middle of your own suffering the stories of flannery don't often finish in that suffering they usually point right. to something beyond the suffering i mean i teach the stories and i i i do believe that and i you know with a lot of literature and especially difficult literature um that flannery gives us i do think that um 
that it's something that's best done or most effectively done in community. Um, I mean, reading good literature and reading it well, uh, which is something I care about, is a skill and it can be practiced, but it has to be taught. You have to be taught well. Um, and then of course you can't, anyone can go do it on their own, but it's, it's, it's not something that comes really naturally to us. I mean, in one sense, we are interpretive creatures. We do interpret all the time, but it's not something that we're aware of necessarily, or we've taught ourselves to be conscious or aware um, about. And so I think the classroom is a good yeah. place to, to teach and, and read Flannery O'Connor. And I wouldn't just, you know, go out and recommend her to all the strangers in the world that I don't know and, and don't know what their, you know, their, their reading skill levels are and their interpretive skills are. She's difficult. Well, I mean, I, while you were talking, I was thinking, or the Sunday school classroom. I mean, how cool would that be if there was a church that had Flannery O'Connor in Sunday school? That would be pretty cool, I think. <laughs> I, would, I would love to do that now that I'm like, thinking about it. Um, we were talking about her prayer journal before mm. we started recording. And in here, she takes um, she takes suffering, I think, to the next level. And I'm not sure 100% whether she would agree with what she wrote in her prayers when she was 20, sure. you know, when she died at 39. But at this point in her life, she was reading Bleu, right? It looks like Bloy. I hate French. Um, sorry, I shouldn't say that. I'm not great with <laughs> French language. Being a Texan, I say everything wrong. And I'm just aware of my limitations there. But here she's reading him and he is so into suffering as a move towards redemption, the way that you talk about it, but so much so that he feels like you have to always move towards suffering. Like you have to want the suffering. And so she's responding to him in her prayers. She says, it is hard to want to suffer. I presume grace is necessary for the want. And then she continues to talk in her prayers about being too mediocre and too weak to desire suffering. What are your thoughts on that? Well, again, I think this is where maybe her Catholicism might take her too far in, in one direction. And we want might want to correct that, but again, not go too far in the opposite direction. But I as I talk about in on reading well, um, you know, the word suffering in English is related to the word, um, it comes from the word passion, mm -hmm. at, which is also related to patience. And patience is a virtue. So Part of it's a word thing and an etymology thing, which I love, but um, sometimes we can, these words lose their shades. Of, I mean, they're there, but we forget yeah. the shades of meaning. So in some ways we could say that suffering is, is, it is passion because it comes mm -hmm. from that word um, and it's patience. And so if we connect all those, we could see how there's a certain kind of, of suffering, um, you know, think of, of the most sort of. English Protestant person, you could get Alfred Lord Tennyson, mm -hmm. who says in, in memoriam, you know, it is better to have loved and lost and never to have loved at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's talking about that to love, to have passion for someone. And he was talking about a friendship, not a romantic relationship, but still someone that he, um, you know, his best friend that he loved and, and mm -hmm. who died. And he, that's something that we would, we suffer when we lose someone or we, you know, love someone. Um, and we, most of us want that in our lives. We want passion. We want um, that kind of suffering. And I mean, that's why Catholics refer to, and, and we Protestants should as well, Christ's crucifixion as the passion of Christ. He suffered mm -hmm. for us because of his love for us. So, you know, again, these are, these are things that we should talk about and understand, I think in a, in a way that, um, in which we avoid, um, the excess or deficiency of it. And so that's another gift that O'Connor can offer us is to just ask, well, what did she mean? And what are the limits of that point? Yeah. I mean, you sound very Aristotelian and I think that's, you know, that was kind of the heart of on reading well is this, this balance. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about suffering, I think you quote somebody as saying um, suffering is an involuntary humiliation, right? It's something that is a, it, it has a right. effect right. on you. Um, but the Catholic, the Catholic imagination would talk about it in terms of a voluntary humiliation right. in order to participate in Christ's suffering, to identify with Christ's suffering. And, and in, you know, violent buried away, which maybe you're not fresh on right now, but at the same time, you know, you remember Raber like sleeps on a iron bed or something, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. he, um, I can't remember all the details. Yeah. He sleeps in an iron bed. He works sitting in a straight back chair. He eats frugally, but this is Raber. 
Mm -hmm. And yet it's the same kind of things that he learned from Mason in the story, right? This Mason beats himself and goes without food. And I mean, you have these two different characters and you can't really tell the difference in their habits. Yet one is uplifted as like this prophet of God. And the other one is this school teacher who's an atheist away from God. I mean, Mm -hmm. what is O'Connor trying to do with this idea of voluntary suffering? I mean, is she appreciating it? Is she attacking it? I mean, Hmm. yeah, I think, I mean, you know, of course we, we know that that Catholics have a long history and tradition of, of uh, what we would call today in today's jargon, self-punishing behaviors as sort Mm -hmm. of penance from flagellation to an ascetic lifestyle. And, you know, Catherine of Siena who literally, you know, starved herself to death. And we would see that as an extreme. And yet I think this novel and this this whole idea invites us to look at what we do in our own contemporary context Mm -hmm. i mean some of the things that we do are very self-punishing i mean someone from in another planet who came down here and saw us you know scrolling on our phones all day or posting you know pictures of ourselves that are being commented on and drawing ourselves away from you know our real life relationships Mm -hmm. and you know our communities um you know i mean there's good that comes from all of these technologies don't get me wrong but still there are some things we willingly subject ourselves to Mm -hmm. that causes suffering because we think we're going to get something out of it in return and maybe we do but um i think there are lots of ways that we can punish ourselves Mm -hmm. that don't look like um you know medieval catholicism but are still essentially the same yeah i mean ways of um maybe a form of asceticism is there is there a way to be ascetic in a suburban or middle class life like is that a is that a reality is that a possibility maybe like a whole foods <laughs> diet or something yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I don't someone, know you were talking about from an alien's perspective like if you look at someone running or working out i mean right, right, that lady right. looks like that kind of behavior sure sure and i mean and that it you know, we know that it's going to, you know, exercise and, and good eating has rewards. It's actually, it's a small sacrifice for a good reward, but at some point it's easy for any of us to go overboard where, um, the reward, um, does not, you know, meet up with, mm-hmm. with, with the suffering that we're having, we're experiencing. Yeah. What, I mean, what about the suffering through art when we were just talking about people might want to not suffer, or maybe they can get a dose of suffering. I mean, what role does, you know, suffering when we read Flannery Mm O'Connor's novel, Mm -hmm. in what ways does that work on our imagination? Well, you know, I'll go to Aristotle again. Mm -hmm. I mean, in his poetics, he talks about how art, and he was talking specifically about drama and especially tragedy, how it allows us to sort of experience um, the same emotions that we would feel if we were really undergoing or witnessing this in real life and so we can experience these emotions and yet through having them sort of vicariously we can train them and practice and and develop our skills in in feeling them and then letting them go um something that he called catharsis or purgation so i think um you know it, it's just like it, it, cognitive science basically, you know, thousands of years later shows similar things that when we are reading a literary work and we're seeing the world through the eyes of a, of a narrator or character, we're still, u- we're using the same parts of our, our brain um, that we would be if we were talking to a real person or going through something. And so we are actually doing what Aristotle sort of theorized that we were, we're feeling the same emotions, um, activating the same regions of the brain and that is what builds in us you know sympathy and perspective and the kinds of virtues that you know that we all need to practice when we are learning to live better with one another and with ourselves yeah so do you think it's virtuous to read Flannery (laughs) O'Connor I I do now if it's a stumbling block in some way um and you know the last time I taught uh a good man is hard to find I mean I've been teaching it for probably not necessarily every year depending on my courses but I've been teaching it for about 20 years and a lot has changed in 20 years Mm -hmm. and Ocon I mean the two things I'll point to that have changed are our increased sensitivity to racial slurs, which I think is good. I'm glad that we're sensitive to those things. Um, And also sort of our increased sensitivity in general. So, you know, the younger generations coming up have been through a lot and they have 
they are more empathetic with one another. And so I think in some ways they feel things more deeply. And so O'Connor mm -hmm. is extremely harsh to them in a variety of ways. So I found that I need to sort of prepare my students more to mm -hmm. read her than I did in the past. Or maybe I'm just a better teacher and, and <laughs> I'm more aware, I don't know. But I do think um, we need to be sensitive to um, just whatever baggage or um, challenges students might be bringing to the classroom mm -hmm. and prepare them. I wouldn't just, you know, start it with it on the first day and, and, and not give them a context for understanding um, that she is in, in many respects, a satirist. Mm -hmm. So she is um, presenting words and ideas ironically, mm -hmm. um, but she does it so well and so subtly that we sometimes assume that what she is having her characters say um, is what she believes. And so irony is, is very difficult um, and, and a sophisticated kind of use of language. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the other things that makes her hard. So we just have to prepare our students and our, and uh, for it. And um, I do think that she can help us to attain virtue. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're bringing up such a great point because I, I read her when I was 15 and I, I didn't have a teacher. I just read her book. Wow. I mean, I just, <laughs> Yeah, a, a professor had given me one short story. So I went and bought the completed mm -hmm. stories and then just read all of them over and over and over again. Um, and I didn't have, I just didn't have that sensitivity. You know, I was reading about dead bodies all the time and R.L. Stein and Christopher Pike novels. And so mm. um, for me, it was the same kind of, I mean, it fit in the horror genre because that's the framework I had as a teenager. I read a lot of horror too, Jessica. It's like, it's like <laughs> we were separated at birth or something. My goodness. <laughs> so I just, I, yeah, I didn't have that same kind of, uh, it didn't have that effect on me right, right. when I was young. Um, and I think also maybe what throws people is for Flannery that the satire is also directed at the reader, which can mm, feel yes. very harsh. I mean, you yes. said in your book, you know, we are all Mrs. Turpin and, mm -hmm. She intends that she she's not just confessing herself as Mrs. Turpin and holding Mrs. Turpin up as a character to imitate. She's saying, look, look at yourself in this text. Right. 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 Um, right. What happens to her characters is never exaltation. And to go back to a good man is hard to find, which really is wonderful to teach to college mm -hmm. students. The grandmother is so much like many mm -hmm. people's real grandmothers. Right. And that's what's so disorienting is because we don't know if we're supposed to like her yeah. or not but guess what yeah. that's what real life is like we meet people you know and they aren't as clearly categorized as like like this person don't like good bad I mean real people are complicated yeah. and we have to make decisions about their moral character and none of them are completely black or white mm -hmm. we're all complicated and mixed um mm -hmm. and that's what O'Connor shows us so well in her works well, and, and the grandmother, you're not supposed to like her. You're supposed to love her, which is even harder. Or what right. it shows you is you're going to end up being okay with her being shot. You know, I mean, it's, right. it's one of those right. things where it really challenges your way of seeing other people. Right. In addition to seeing yourself, which is one of the reasons I, I love her work, right? It puts you, it puts the responsibility on the reader. Right? It, it, exactly. I mean, it's a, it is such a, a test of our character and our judgment mm -hmm. and our discernment and discernment. And as you said, our charity, mm -hmm. um, that's what she's demanding of us. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you said something about, um, if it's a stumbling block and I thought of her epigraph to wise blood where she says for some, uh, belief in, in Christ is a stumbling block, mm -hmm. right? She's quoting, like she's alluding directly to the scriptures, um, in the opening, she knows that what she's portraying she's trying to imitate the Bible in the way that she writes it. She's right, trying right. to demand your charity when you're faced with all of these unlovable characters. Mm. Um, well, and then she explains sort of the method um, that she uses in mystery and manners, her collection of, of lectures and essays about her writing and the, and the craft of writing. And she has that famous quote from there and I'll, I'll just paraphrase it, but she says, you know, to, sometimes to the heart of hearing, you have to shout into the blind, you have to draw large startling pictures. We're so numb and so accustomed mm -hmm. to the, what is irregular and abnormal in our culture that she just has to, it's almost like a looking what is it looking <laughs> yeah a, a funhouse like mirror yeah, right right a carnival. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to, 
you know, to sort of redirect and reorient us so that we can see what is strange and odd and even wrong Mm -hmm. for being Mm -hmm. that because we can no longer see it in our world today. And it's, and I'm, I'm so glad you ended with that quote from mystery and manners because um, that really is the call of the gospels, right? Jesus over and over again said like, don't be deaf, don't be blind. And if there's any gift, I feel like Flannery gives us, it's that she helps us go away from our blindness and away from our darkness towards light, towards vision in a way that for me, no other writer does. I mean, she's, she's my favorite author by far. Um, but I'm sure, you know, I also uplift other writers like you do in your book, um, for doing that same kind of vision orienting of us. So, well, um, I'll just end with one question for you. If you were going to start someone with a virtuous habit of reading Flannery O'Connor, where would you send them? I would send them first. I would go tend to her short stories. Mm -hmm. And I, the first short story that I would have them read is Revelation because I think that story sort of shows most obviously what she's about in all of her um, short stories. So the order I usually give is revelation, good country people, and then a good man is hard to find. And then just go to the rest of the short stories. I love that. Well, thank you for geeking out with me. I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Jessica. I'm glad to. 